Welcome to Themis Podcasts. Themis is a risk management firm specialising in financial crime. Our aim of these podcasts is to bring you interesting news, interviews and recordings of our exclusive events from the world of financial crime. Pandora Papers, an interview with ICIJ senior investigative journalist Will Fitzgibbon. In our latest podcast, Elizabeth Humphrey, financial crime researcher at Themis, speaks to Will Fitzgibbon, senior investigative journalist at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, the ICIJ, regarding the recently released Pandora Papers, the largest leak of offshore data in history. Will discusses his inside insights on the evolving story and its implications for the fight against financial crime. Welcome, Will. It is fantastic to have the opportunity to speak with you today to get your unique inside perspective on the Pandora Papers. Will Fitzgibbon is a senior journalist at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists and is the ICIJ's Africa and Middle East Partnership Coordinator. In 2015, he led a major pan-African investigation into the abuses of the Australian mining industry on the African continent and has since been involved in the Panama, Paradise, and most recently, the Pandora Papers. With this rich background and jurisdictional focus on the Middle East and Africa, areas of, of, in which Themis focuses heavily, Will can offer us unique insights on this emerging story, the largest release of offshore financial activity in world history. So just to give us some background, the Pandora Paper is a groundbreaking collaboration to expose offshore financial dealings of the world's richest of an unprecedented size. The ICIJ collaborated with one, over 150 news outlets and 14 law firms and service providers working in a range of tax havens from your classic tropical oases, British Virgin Islands, Panama and the like to sort of the elephant in the room, havens across the United States. The paper is disclose offshore financial activities pertaining to over 35 current and former world leaders, over 300 officials from 117 countries presenting devastating findings beyond the scope of previous similar publications, such as the uh, Pan Panama Papers. So, uh, Will, I wonder if you could start us off sort of by setting the scene. Uh, how did the Pandora Papers sort of first emerge? Uh, what were the first seeds of it? And were you in the room sort of from the outset? Well, hello, and thanks very much for having me. Um, the Pandora Papers really began with ICIJ's director, Jared Ryle, um, who has been at ICIJ for many, many years now and has spearheaded all of our previous offshore investigations. I was not in the room where it happened, to quote a line from the musical Hamilton. Um, so I don't know exactly how the first set of documents came to ICIJ, but they were received over time, right? This is not something where magically... Jared Ryle or any journalist woke up at 7.30 in the morning and all of a sudden had 12 million documents um, on a computer somewhere. That's not how any real investigation works. And the Pandora Papers were really a drip, drip, drip of files over almost two years. Um, and I think that's important contextually because these kind of investigations aren't just data dumps. Sometimes you see the Pandora Papers referred to as such in media or in Roundup sort of descriptions of what the project is. But this is hard work. Getting this information is hard work, let alone the two years that hundreds of reporters spent trying to work out what the heck it all means. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, just to get a sense of that, are you were you aware from the outset, uh, given the sort of drip drip nature of these things, that the Pandora Papers were sort of going to end up presenting a historic project that surpassed the scope of previous projects uh, of a similar nature, you know, the Panama Papers and, and, and the like, which we, we, we did speak previously to um, Gerard about in July, a great conversation. Uh, but yeah, I would be really interested to know your perspective from the outset about the scope of, of the project. Well, there are a few things that interested us from the beginning. First of all, was the diverse nature of the source material. As you mentioned, the Pandora Papers is different in that it's not just leaked records from one offshore service provider, but from 14 offshore service providers. And why that's important and interesting is that it gives us an insight 
into different jurisdictions and also different client bases. You know, the people who are setting up shell companies in the Seychelles or in Hong Kong or in South Dakota are probably going to be different in terms of background, wealth, um, and activity from those who are using Panama or the British Virgin Islands. So that was important. We also really wanted to see how the offshore industry had changed. You know, the Panama Papers was five, six years ago now, and governments made all kinds of promises. And the Pandora Papers was really a chance to see how some of those promises had either created or not created changes in the offshore system. You know, were laws that better controlled beneficial ownership or were laws that banned bearer shares uh, instrumental in modifying the offshore system? Did people ultimately change their behavior because of that? They're the kind of questions we wanted to know from the beginning. But also, to be perfectly honest, we knew from the outset that the Pandora Papers was potentially explosive because some of the names were just so big. As you mentioned, hundreds of politicians, 35 current or former heads of state at least, although I found a another former prime minister recently, just a week or two ago. You know, as soon as you see the passport of the King of Jordan, you kind of realize, ah, we're onto something here. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I definitely want to touch on a range of a range of points that you just made. Um, before we move into the sort of substantive outcomes of the um, Pandora Papers, I wanted to just ask a couple more questions about the sort of process mm. that uh, the ICIJ went through. As you said, the Panama Papers really only encompassed leaks from one offshore company, while the Pandora Papers brought together data from, you know, 14 offshore providers in all these different jurisdictions. What were the unique challenges around working in so many jurisdictions? Certainly there were challenges. You know, first of all, each jurisdiction, even though we might call them tax havens generally, have their own laws, have their own histories, have their own due diligence requirements, have their own regulations on offshore service providers when it comes to uh, AML, anti-money laundering, for example. So every new jurisdiction and every new provider required us as reporters to do even more research on each of those intricacies, um, which of course can take time and can be incredibly difficult to really uh, put the tail on the donkey in that aspect. I think why it was also Uh, more challenging with different offshore providers was that each of these offshore providers has their own internal management systems. One of the convenient things about the Panama Papers was that Mossack Fonseca had one internal management system, which meant that every offshore company, its owner, its activity had a folder that you could search. When you're talking about the Pandora Papers and 14 offshore providers, there were some of them that had very simple documentation, you know, spreadsheets, that said who the beneficial owner was. Other offshore providers didn't have that. Journalists had to go digitally rummaging through thousands or tens of thousands of records to connect A to B, which was something that took journalists a long time. And of course, it made the data journalism aspect of this project even more challenging than previously. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess related to data and the many challenges that it presents, particularly given uh, sort of their unprecedented scope and extended research timeline, did you ever have concerns ahead of the release that the project would be leaked? And how did you manage to keep it sort of under wraps uh, with so many contributing news outlets across so many different jurisdictions, contributing law firms, service providers, and the like? Oh, absolutely. Being an employee of ICIJ and being responsible for a collaboration of this nature is basically every day to wake up with a cold sweat, wondering who or what has let slip news of the Pandora Papers in advance. Trust me, that just happens every morning. Thankfully, it didn't happen. And I think that's not just due to blind luck. You know, ICOJ and its partners could publish the Pandora Papers because we'd done it a number of times before, albeit on a smaller scale. You know, I think collaboration is such a buzzword now in so many industries, but let's not forget that a successful collaboration like the Pandora Papers requires experience, it requires control, and it requires trust. The good thing about this project was that all of the journalists involved really were part of the ICOJ network previously. And that meant that we could trust one another. And trust me, you do not want to be the one journalist out of 600 journalists who screws everything up. And I think that that helps us in part. 
To move on to some of the more substantive results that came out of the Panama Papers, it'd be great to get a sense of some of what you see as the most shocking investigative findings. Um, And of course, this is still an evolving story with new stories coming out all the time just because of the sheer quantity of data. Um, But yeah, it'd be great to hear some of the highlights in your perspective as the investigation continues to unravel. Well, I think one of the great things about these kind of investigations is that impact and important stories are everywhere. You know, the reporter in Argentina has a very different perspective on the impact and importance of Pandora Papers from a reporter in Indonesia, for example. So all that is to say, my perspective is going to be very different from other perspectives. You know, this morning, as I'm talking to, there was news in Chile that overnight the parliament there voted uh, on an impeachment motion of the president there as a result of the Pandora Papers investigation. So that's obviously huge. Um, You know, I focused a lot on uh, reporting on uh, heads of state in Kenya and Jordan in particular, revealing really for the first time the secretive offshore hideaways of these two world leaders who have really tried to build a public image as transparency advocates. And I think that was one of the shocking and for some people uh, maddening revelations from the Pandora Papers was that, sure, we all know that kleptocrats and criminals in general love the secrecy of the offshore system. But the Pandora Papers really shone a light on politicians who otherwise try and present a very different image, the image of people who are in favour of transparency, fight against corruption. And the Pandora Papers showed, you know, in the case of the King of Jordan, a $106 million secret property empire with glorious luxury mansions overlooking the coast of California that had never been declared before, never acknowledged Uh, to his people, let alone to any of the international donors who give Jordan over a billion dollars in foreign aid each year. So I think they were significant. You know, I also really spent a lot of my time in the Pandora Papers working on the US angle. But something that really excited me about this project was that for the first time, the Pandora Papers included leaked records from inside a significant offshore operation within the United States. That is uh, a trust company and a corporate service provider with an office in South Dakota. And we could see really for the first time en masse the kinds of clients who were setting companies and trusts up there. Um, Those were of particular interest uh, for me throughout the reporting of this project. At this point, I want to take a quick pause to briefly talk about Themis. Themis helps clients and members identify and manage their specific financial crime risks through a combination of innovation, insight, and intelligence. Our cutting edge platform helps organizations understand these strategic threats through an ESG and socioeconomic lens and protects their customers, staff, suppliers, and shareholders from criminal attacks or association. Visit our website at www.crime.financial to find out more. So discussing a bit more in depth your uh, findings on, on the King of Jordan, on the you know Kenyan president, Kenyatta, these real uh, world leaders who have long emphasized anti-corruption efforts at the heart of you know, their government priorities, and yet this recent leak seems to undermine that um, on a personal level. I would just flag others, including Ecuadorian President Guillermo Lasso, the current prime minister of Lebanon, his predecessor, Hassan Diab, all these leaders sort of from quite struggling economies during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, coming out of the woodwork as uh, as part of these findings. How do you see this impacting uh, the political landscape in terms of stability? Look, uh, I'm not naive. And obviously, in many of those cases you just mentioned, uh, we're not going to immediately or even in the long term see uh, visible concrete impact. You know, no one expects the King of Jordan, who uh, is a sovereign, who has complete control over a country, who oversees a widely feared security state apparatus, no one expects him to resign tomorrow because of the Pandora Papers. The same in Kenya. The president actually, would you believe it, has actually said publicly that the Pandora Papers is lies, despite the fact that his name literally appears in one of the documents from the leaked records. So in many of these countries, uh, there are unlikely to be, I think what many of us would think of as kind of visible, immediate, direct impacts, such as resignations um, or lawsuits. But I'm very much of the opinion, and I think many journalists are, that 
notwithstanding the absence of a resignation or a court case, for example. These kind of disclosures are hugely important for a number of reasons. They start and in many cases continue important public discussions uh, by citizens. You know, I really think it's important that the Pandora Papers is now something that a driver in Amman, Jordan, or a seller of bananas in Nairobi, Kenya, is something that these kind of people can talk about with their friends and with their family in a way that uh, continues to feed discussions around transparency, around justice. Uh, you know, five years ago, no one was talking about what an offshore company was. Can you imagine? Like these string of investigations from Panama Papers to Pandora Papers really have changed the narrative around illicit financial flows, around transparency, around corruption. And the mere fact that these world leaders own shell companies and had secret offshore deals might not necessarily be illegal in every case, but it certainly raises important uh, governance questions, important transparency questions. And I think they're the kind of long-term impacts that we're likely to see here. Yeah, and, and as you raise the point around shell companies themselves not explicitly being illegal, um, I wanted to turn to that and, and some of the financial crime elements of, of, this, uh, of this release. As, as we say, cell companies can in fact serve some, some quite legitimate uh, purposes, particularly for those sort of functioning in politically or financially high risk jurisdictions. Um, that said, uh, many of these prominent figures who've been flagged in the Pandora Papers have been very quick to sort of turn to this to argue that their use of offshore shells is fully legal. Um, do you see that a risk in sort of the legitimate reasons for the use of offshore mechanisms uh, being used as a narrative to cover over financial crime? And I guess more broadly, have you seen the Pandora Papers bringing to light any particular cases of sort of traffickers, fraudsters and criminals hiding behind and concealing their money in offshore structures? It's a really important point. And I think from the outset, sure, let's acknowledge one thing that it's not like there's a law in countries or an international law that says owning an offshore company is illegal full stop. Sure, that is granted. But I think it's very important to know that journalists are not prosecutors and judges. And the users of these companies are not prosecutors and judges themselves. And the legality of what was done with these companies or these trusts, wherever they are around the world, takes a lot of time and a lot of effort by police and prosecutors to work out what was legal and what was illegal. I've worked on these kind of topics for six or seven years now, and it always amazes me how it takes years for the truth of these scenarios to come out. So when a politician says nothing was illegal here, that's actually not their call to make, is it? That's the call of judges or prosecutors who we already know in many countries uh, investigations are underway as a result of the Pandora Papers. ICIJ has received a number of requests from governments to access the data. Now, we never share data with governments, but that's a sign that countries around the world are interested in having this data. And all I would say to listeners is, you know, watch this space. I'd be very surprised if in months or years we didn't see criminal charges emerging around the world as a result of this. Even though, to answer your original point, of course, the mere act of owning a shell company isn't illegal. It's what you do with it and it's what you don't do with it. Now, in some, in some countries, the, the rules are quite simple. There are stories about politicians in Nigeria from the Pan Pandora Papers, for example, who have reportedly broken rules and laws in Nigeria by the simple fact of owning these shell companies and not declaring them. That's one reason why reporters focus in on whether or not politicians declared these secretive assets. And in so many cases, they simply didn't. But you know, the Pandora Papers also really speaks to a whole range of criminals. We're talking about alleged members of the mafia. We're talking about people who've been convicted of bribery and corruption around the world. Uh, we're talking about, for example, in one case that my colleagues at ICIJ wrote about, a uh, very well-known dealer in ancient antiquities from Cambodia. And just yesterday, the United States uh, government uh, released an indictment uh, concerning that uh, art dealer, uh, who is now deceased. Mm -hmm. But he appears and his family appears in the Pandora Papers with a whole range of trusts and shell companies that many experts believe were kind of central to the 
obscuring process that allowed him to, uh, at least according to US pro uh, prosecutors, trade in illicit antiquities for decades and decades. So there definitely are shades of gray. There are outright criminals in the Pandora Papers, and then there are uh, those people who it might take us six months or even six years to have a true, um, a true sense of whether or not what they were doing with their shell company was licit or not. Yeah, it certainly presents challenges that will continue to be debated for many years, I'm sure. And the ex then sort of to follow up on this, the extent of secrecy and complexity of these offshore systems seems to make it quite difficult to sort of distinguish between proceeds of criminality versus wealth that comes from sort of perfectly legitimate sources. Uh, given this challenge, how do we get a sense of the real scope of the problem, uh, either today or in a year or 10 years? I think that's one of the scariest realizations in this kind of area is that no one knows what they don't know. You know, the United Nations famously, I think more than 10 years ago now, estimated something like one or two percent of all the illicit financial flows that move around the world annually are caught and recorded. That means that nearly every cent of dirty money that's currently throwing, flowing through the universe is not caught, is not being recognized, is not even seen by governments around the world. And I think that's a rather frightening realization, given, as you said earlier, how many problems exist in society currently that could and should be funded um, if there were the resources and the political will to do so. So what a project like the Pandora Papers does is open that door just a little bit more it says, look, the world is full of secret money and full of secretive dodgy deals that unfortunately will not in their entirety probably ever come to light. But what the Pandora Papers can do is say, but here are a whole bunch of secretive deals and secretive offshore companies, including by politicians that you've never heard of before, as a way of putting on record, I suppose, um, what extra can be known really the pandora papers we should all think of like the tip of the iceberg if we've found these 330 politicians from around the world just from 12 million records imagine how many other politicians weren't in the pandora papers that have been doing exactly the same thing absolutely to turn to a, a specific case that you that you have alluded to already um the Pandora Papers seem to shine unprecedented light upon the U.S. as the sort of world's largest tax haven, upending this mainstream perception of the tax haven as exclusively a sandy island oasis. And apparently, from my reading, 17 out of 20 of the world's least restrictive jurisdictions for trusts are American states. It would be great to hear your initial thoughts on that. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, very early on, I was excited by the opportunity in the Pandora Papers to tell a new story about the United States. That's because one of these 14 service providers whose leaked records we had, Trident Trust Company, has an office in South Dakota. And as a result, we had a number of files from that South Dakota office of Trident Trust Company. And this was important because in the nerdy literature of the offshore world, anyone who's paid attention has heard rumors that the US is a major tax haven. States like Delaware, Nevada, Alaska, New Hampshire, South Dakota, uh, Tennessee even, have been known to, over the past you know, de few decades or so, to have introduced laws that have increased corporate secrecy uh, and, of course, been very uh, attractive for people who wanted to pay as little tax as possible. But what was important about the Pandora Papers was that we were finally able to move from the world of rumour to the world of the concrete. That is, we could say, here finally are the names of some of the people who've been moving their assets to the United States. And in particular, here are some of the people setting up trusts in South Dakota, none of which had ever been disclosed before. And this included the president of Ecuador, the former vice president of the Dominican Republic, you know, a Brazilian billionaire, an Argentinian millionaire, uh, sorry, a Colombian millionaire who many years ago had been named in a US forfeiture action uh, that was part of a uh, money laundering and drug trafficking scheme. So as I'm researching the Pandora Papers and seeing all these names related to the United States, it was quite exciting because we were finally able to say or have the opportunity to tell a story about how, why, and who was using the US 
as an offshore system. And it was all quite recently. I think what was interesting with the Pandora Papers was many of the cases we saw involved individuals who, for example, had a trust in Jersey or the British Virgin Islands, classic tax havens, were moving or transferring their offshore structures to South Dakota and to the United States really in the most recent time period, past four or five years. And I think that's significant. Absolutely. And a slew of reforms have been announced in response to the Panama Papers, perhaps most notably from the U.S. Uh, they've released, uh, our Congress has released a the so-called Enablers Act, which uh, calls for more stringent due diligence among all players, not just banks involved in facilitating offshore investment. So in my mind, this is a sort of deja vu to reforms announced after Panama and for that matter, since the Patriot Act. Um, well, do you think there will be a real change this time around from the U.S.? And I guess, do you see this uh, set of stories propelling other changes in favor of transparency on a, on a more global scale? Well, it was pretty remarkable that the Enablers Act came out so quickly as a bill in the United States as it did. Now, in past investigations, the United States really, in my experience, has been notably silent on uh, many of these findings. So clearly the Pandora Papers hit home with a certain American policy audience, which I think is promising and to be welcomed. You know, the loopholes identified in the Enablers Act are things that experts on financial crime uh, experts have been shouting about from the rooftops for years. So that's promising. You know, will it pass? That's a huge question. You know, the offshore industry survives in part because it's used by very powerful people and it also makes a lot of money for very powerful people. You know, lawyers, trust companies, uh, real estate agents, art dealers, for example. So the reforms that the Enablers Act identifies are by no means locked in, but it's certainly a good start. I think because of the multitudinous aspects of the offshore system, the number of loopholes that exist, the number of different tax havens that are out there, I think there's never going to be a silver bullet. There's never going to be one law or one reform at a national or even an international level that will immediately fix things. You know, we saw that with beneficial ownership registration. You know, that's been a, a policy goal of many transparency advocates for many years, and many countries have now introduced such laws. But transparency or beneficial ownership registries in and of themselves don't lead to the end of corruption. They don't lead to the end of financial crime. As we see in part through the Pandora Papers, people who want to keep hiding things will always find a way to do so. You know, whether or not they move from the British Virgin Islands to South Dakota or to the United Arab Emirates, whether or not they use new structures, you know, they move from an LLC to a foundation or to a trust. There are so many ways in which people who really want to avoid transparency can do so. That means that reform is difficult, but I really think that this is a long game here. You know, that there isn't a silver bullet and that tweaks to legislation do have an effect. And I've seen that in thousands of emails that I read, you know, from the Pandora Papers. Um, you know, when new laws are introduced in the British Virgin Islands, in the Cayman Islands, in the Netherlands, for example, the users of the offshore system do respond. And I think that gives me hope because it shows that even if there's one fewer person or one less person in the world who chooses to avoid taxes or chooses to hide the proceeds of crime through the offshore system because of a slight tweak in a regulation in one country, then I think that's already a victory. Yeah, it seems like the legislation to combat these issues does need to be at a global scale eventually to avoid a sort of whack-a-mole effect. Is that fair to say? I think that's absolutely true. We've seen time and time again how reforms in one country uh, can really just become a boon to another country. And so I think you're right. I think a global solution, at least according to experts we speak to, would be, would, would be preferable. That's why many advocates talk about the United Nations being or becoming or taking on a greater role in terms of transparency and international tax matters, because that's an institution and a platform that represents all countries, not just the interests, say, of developed countries like the OECD. To turn back to the U.S. just for another minute, um, the new regulation, as we've discussed, uh, the Enablers Act, does increase pressure on a range of stakeholders, law firms, accountants, real estate companies, trust fund providers, and the like. Um, we can see them all as those who sort of oil the wheels of secrecy. 
How do you expect uh, them to respond to this new regulation? Well, I've certainly heard from people within the United States that they don't expect it to be easy. You know, that the industry and lobby groups of real estate agents and lawyers don't want things to change. You know, these specialized enabler industries have had an exception carved out for them from a long time for a long time. An exception that basically means these enablers don't have to do as much due diligence research into their clients as say banks do. Um, so if you're an industry that's making money from this exemption, you're probably going to fight pretty darn hard to keep that exemption. But I think the landscape has shifted. You know, one of the big successes or grounds, one of the big transformations in the understanding of the offshore system in the past five years is that tackling the inequalities and the iniquities of the secretive offshore system has moved from being purely a financial issue to being one that is now embraced by, in the United States at least, the members of the law enforcement community or the national security industry. And that's important because now all of a sudden you've got people who worked for the FBI or people who work for prosecutors' offices or people who work for counterintelligence who are also saying, actually, the Enablers Act is important because even if ICIJ identified uh, millionaires and billionaires who weren't necessarily up to anything criminal, how do we know that these same loopholes are not being used by terrorist financiers, for example? So that change has been significant. And I think that change gives many experts in the United States hope that reforms can get over the line that probably wouldn't have succeeded five years ago. Some say the U.S. is the player sort of with the most leverage to end offshore financial abuses with the U.S. dollar being the global currency and international transactions flowing en masse through New York. And while the U.S. has made some efforts to crack down in, in the years past, in general, as you've said, um, they've been quite slow to pass measures and in particular, reg regulations have focused for the most part on U.S. citizens rather than on foreign investors. Uh, one question that comes to mind from a sort of devil's advocate perspective is, do you think that the incentive to maintain foreign investment in the U.S. Uh, or into the U.S. outweighs this pressure to control the problem? I think that is a pressure and that that came quite clearly through in my reporting. You know, when I'd speak to lawmakers in a state like South Dakota, for example, a state that has been increasingly attracting millions, hundreds of millions, and even billions of dollars from, uh, from foreigners. The response really in South Dakota was, as long as it helps my state, as long as it helps bring employment to the kids of South Dakota, then I'm less interested in what happens overseas or who these foreigners are. Um, you know, that's a refrain that we heard from lawmakers in places like South Dakota quite regularly, which was, look, I'm focused on my own backyard. I don't have the time or necessarily the interest in knowing everything that's happening in every corner of the world. And I think you've hit the nail on the head there by saying there are those competing interests. And that's why tax havens thrive and exist, because a tax haven wants to build an economic base for itself, and it can only do so by uh, attracting international investment. And the more questions you ask about that international investment, the less of an economic success story your tax haven is going to be. So, uh, so you're quite right. This is going to be one of those ongoing struggles in any reform that is uh, proposed, let alone passed. Yeah, fighting, in, fighting incentives, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and going more globally, uh, it is widely understood that reforms are absolutely needed to increase the transparency around ultimate beneficial ownership in particular. Uh, of off offshore assets. But in the UK, there has been significant delay to progress on this front. Uh, I would note that MPs have been sitting on a key bill to register foreign companies owning UK properties since 2016. Uh, so from your perspective, why isn't that moving? Well, I think this is one of the main reasons we published the Pandora Papers, revealing the number of politicians who have secretive offshore interests and although none of them are foolish enough to say this themselves, I think many of us can make the connection, can't we? That if you've got hundreds of politicians who are benefiting from the secretive offshore world, then is it any surprise that bills around transparency or bills to overhaul the secrecy of the offshore industry are stalling? I think many people say one explains the other. 
right? Um, you know, in the Pandora Papers, there were huge revelations about the number of politicians from around the world who owned luxury property in London. Very often they owned luxury property in London that their governmental salaries couldn't really justify, um, uh, let alone kind of Saudi or Middle Eastern royals who own ridiculously expensive London homes. And I think to go back to those competing interests that we were talking about earlier, you know, if you've got wealthy and powerful people who are benefiting from the offshore system, there's little doubt in my mind that at least some of them would prefer the status quo, which probably means that legislation to overhaul the system is going to take longer to be introduced than it might otherwise, if it was just simple folk like you and I who were benefiting from this financial system in the first place, which of course we're not. Absolutely. Um, as a final question, I wanted to ask about the backlash from those named in the papers. Has the backlash been particularly strong in response to the Panama paper, uh, the Pandora Papers? And in on a personal level, have there ever been times when you or your colleagues have felt in danger as a result of the evidence that has begun to unfold? I think it's an unfortunate reality of investigative journalism in our era that anyone who questions the wealthy and the powerful can be threatened, uh, pilloried, uh, insulted, you know, ranging from threats on social media to uh, hugely expensive lawsuits that, you know, oligarchs in Russia often favor, for example, the kind of slap lawsuits that often can be used to try and put journalists out of business. And the Pandora Papers was no exception. There were a number of journalists in countries from Russia to Ecuador, for example, to countries in Uganda, for example, where those who were named in the Pandora Papers uh, made a whole range of, or exercised a whole range of pressures on journalists to not tell stories. Um, that's something that ICOJ and it's the journalists in our network are used to facing, unfortunately. Um, you know, lawsuits are quite common. Um, death threats on social media are quite common. And that's something that we as reporters, unfortunately, have come become used to. I would say that one of the reasons ICOJ exists is because collaboration can help protect journalists. If you're one solitary reporter with an explosive story on the secret finances of your president, it's relatively easy for that president and his or her allies to exert pressure on one reporter, but it's a lot harder for that president to exert pressure on 600 reporters who are telling the same story. So I think there's safety in numbers in some ways, and that's why ICOJ's collaborations exist uh, as they do. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, as a follow-up question, if you could speak to how the journalistic community can respond to these this pushback, I suppose that you you just have in a way responded um, to that question, emphasizing the importance of uh, a collaborative mentality and approach to journalism. Are there any other ways that we can respond and, and beyond just the journalistic community, um, uh, all of us, how can all of us respond? I think a really important way that everyone can respond to something like the Pandora Papers is First of all, to acknowledge its legitimacy and its accuracy. One of the incredibly scary consequences or impacts of the Pandora Papers has been the way in which many politicians, despite me literally seeing their passport, have said, this is fake news, this doesn't exist. And I think that's incredibly problematic because once politicians start saying that facts are lies, then all kinds of horrifying things can happen. So I think members of the public can participate in the ongoing repercussions of Pandora Papers by believing in it, by reading the stories, by having conversations with people around them and saying, you know what, even though the president of Kenya said his name wasn't in the Pandora Papers, it definitely was. Um, you know, making sure that the rich and the powerful uh, don't succeed in their narrative that seeks to undermine journalism. You know, journalism needs to be supported so that it can keep doing what it does, I think. And part of that support is reading the stories of Pandora Papers. It's donating to nonprofit newsrooms who participated in it. It's calling out or supporting journalists when they come under threat. Um, I think all of those things are going to be ongoing responses that people around the world, no matter where they live and no matter how much money they have, can do in order to keep the fires of the Pandora Papers burning.
Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a fantastic conversation. It was a pleasure speaking with you, and we hope we can maintain this conversation as more and more findings come out around this pivotal piece of investigative journalism. I look forward to it. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Will. Thank you for listening to the latest Themis podcast. We hope you found it interesting and informative. If you would like to find out more about Themis, get in touch with us via our website, www.crime.financial. You can also subscribe for future news and interviews.